good afternoon on this beautiful Southern California evening. On behalf of Chancellor Howard Gilman, I want to extend a very warm welcome to you. And I want to especially thank you for making UCI a part of your evening. As a public research university, UCI serves as a public square for Orange County, where more than three million people from a broad cross-section of society live and work. Our goal this evening is not to change anyone's mind in particular, but rather to provide perspective and insight on some of our society's most pressing and enduring challenges. This is particularly the case for this evening's program entitled Protecting Civil Rights and Civil Liberties in Times of Political Crisis. If those aren't enough reasons, I want to add a few others. Let us recall that 2020 marks the 150th anniversary of the ratification of the 15th Amendment, which extended voting rights to black men. It's the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which guaranteed and protected women's constitutional right to vote. And it is the 50th, 55th anniversary of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which submitted the voting rights of black citizens. These major milestones underscore the capacity of this experiment in democracy known as the United States of America for change. Yet I think we can all acknowledge, if not agree, that even in the 21st century, the work of protecting civil rights and civil liberties is far from over. If anything, we know this because these milestones and others required and requires vigilance, courage, and sacrifice to confront the contradictions between the aspirations of the U.S. Constitution and their lived realities. This program is co-hosted by the UCI Law Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy and my office's program on confronting extremism. However, I want to give major kudos to Chancellor's Professor Michelle Goldman for developing this program and giving us the opportunity to engage with such notable colleagues tonight. Please join me in a round of applause to recognize her for this stellar panel. Before we hear from our noted panelists, I am pleased to introduce a major change agent for our world. Over three years ago, our campus was truly honored to have the Reverend Jesse Jackson launch our first Confronting Extremism event. Since that time, we've held nine major public events, welcomed thousands of attendees, and bestowed eight faculty research projects, which engaged over 10,000 UCI members of our campus and the communities that we serve. It is gratifying to come full circle in welcoming Jonathan Luther Jackson to UCI tonight to bring greetings from the Rainbow Push Coalition and Reverend Jess Jackson. Jonathan Jackson himself has been on the forefront of social justice advocacy, a businessman and academic. He joined Reverend Jackson to secure the release of a captured American Navy pilot in Syria and accompanied him on other highly sensitive negotiations to free Americans in Cuba and other locations. Although it has been over a decade, we remember his successful fight to keep 16 Chicago public schools open rather than have students and families disrupted by attending untested charter schools. He continues to advocate for basic rights and freedom of individuals who are wrongfully convicted and incarcerated. As a member of the Rainbow Push Coalition's Board of Directors, Mr. Jackson is part of the helm and history of work conducted nationally and internationally to gain social justice through economic and educational equity and to promote peace and justice around the world. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Jackson. Thank you, Dr. Douglas Haynes. I'd like to thank my very special friend and sister, Dr. Michelle Godwin and her husband, Greg. And on behalf of my father, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, I'm honored to be here in his stead today. He wishes very much that he could have been with you today. And he asked me on this issue of extremism, 
to share his thoughts, particularly in this political climate today. The United States, if we say, is formed in 1619. From 1619 to 1865, African Americans were enslaved for 246 years. From 1865 until 2020, it's been 155 years. The institution of slavery lasted longer than we've been in freedom, number one. Number two, in 1957, on this day, March 5th, this was the day that Ghana received its independence, 63 years ago. And it's not that long ago and not that far away that the tolls of colonialism and the shackles had been on the entire continent of Africa. In our lifetime, we've seen South Africa free. It was the last minority-controlled con country in the world in our lifetime just some 20 years ago. When we talk about extremism today, we're talking about a population that is bustling and growing exponentially. I'm 54 years of age. In 1966, the world population was roughly three and a half billion people. Today, we are approaching eight billion people on planet Earth. Today, when we talk about extremism, global climate is a crisis. I was in India last year in February for the 150th anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. And it was 98 degrees in the wintertime in Calcutta. Global heat is now making migration a major issue. There are 270 million people that are being forced to move around the world because their part of the world is no longer inhabitable by human beings. This is going to have a continuing effect on us all. When we see the, she the seas rising, we see climate changing, people moving for education, people moving for safety, people moving for health, people moving for better opportunities. Confronting extremism, we have to be clear, everything that was once legal does not mean that it was moral. The Holocaust, we should remember, once was legal, but immoral. In the United States, slavery was once legal, but immoral. Women not having the right to vote 100 years ago was legal, but not moral. If they could raise the fathers of the nation and the mothers could not vote, it's simply wrong. What do we have to do in the climate of extremism? We have to teach tolerance. Our scriptures teach us that blessed be the peacemakers. Peace has to be a verb. It has to be active. One thing I've gathered from my father, and there are many things, is that you have to be willing to not follow opinion polls, but to confront and mold opinions. You simply cannot, as the Reverend Martin Luther King, be in the church and look through the stained glass window. He confronted the church to be more of the thermostat, to turn it up, the thermometer, not just to read it, so that we can change the climate and the temperature. My father encourages each and every one of you to vote your conscience, vote your conviction. Don't do what's expedient and convenient and complacent. Do what's right. It was four years ago, it was five years ago now, that I had the opportunity to work with then Mr. Bernie Sanders on his campaign. I remember in 1988, when my father first started running for president, there was a Caucasian man in a very white state that endorsed my father, who was not a political, established Democratic Party leader. Bernie Sanders had the courage of his conviction I think we have to be with people that are aspirational, people that want to raise the floor, not lower the ceiling, people that want to show our children what could be, not what ought to be. Do not limit our children's ambitions and aspirations because we cannot see a better and a brighter day. Years ago, when I lived in Los Angeles, I would tell my children, don't use the word hate. Don't look at people that have different abilities, not disabilities. And I saw my son at five years old looking at a young man in a wheelchair. And I felt bad for the gentleman in the wheelchair, but a child. And my, father, my son was staring at this child with such imagination. And so I pulled him and I asked him, Jonathan, don't look at that child. That's uncomfortable for him. 
because he's in the wheelchair. And my son went back and started looking, and before I knew it, he was talking to the child. And when we got on the plane, I said, why did you go back over there? I was glad to see that you were talking with him, only to realize that my son grew up in a generation of watching on cartoons, not only Buzz Lightyear, but the Transformers. He wanted to see that wheelchair move into a direction where the child could stand up and walk. The children have imaginations. For that, we have to constantly encourage the children to reach out. In my closing remarks, I want to thank the dean and the university for being a center of excellence on thought leadership, on convening you today, on confronting extremism. Can we have some extreme ideas? I'll give you an extreme idea. Every child that has the ability and desire for education, that we provide them access. We recognize the life and value of every human being, and when the coronavirus, or be it Ebola, or be it H1, or be it AIDS, can we build a healthcare infrastructure that values every life for the person that's coughing next to you so that we don't get sick as a consequence? Can we have an extreme idea that we can drive through downtown Los Angeles and not see our veterans homeless and not have to see a world of women that don't have access to shelters and reproductive care. Can we have an extreme idea where we can see the criminal justice system no longer be criminal, but be a justice system that is adequate and fair for all? So I come from the thoughts like Galileo, like Michelangelo, I believe in an extreme idea that peace is possible around the world, that hunger can be eliminated, that our children can one day ask, Dad, what is war? That I can have an extreme idea that our children can ask one day, Dad, what is racism? That our children can have an extreme idea, what is sexism? Dad, what is an extreme idea, what was anti-Semitism? What is an extreme idea? What is homophobia? We can eradicate these issues and live a more peaceful and prosperous life. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I think you just dropped the microphone up here. <laughs> Strangely, it's attached, but I think it was just dropped. Uh, with that, I'd like to welcome uh, to the stage uh, my great friends and colleagues who've flown all across the country, even in the wake of corona, to come to California and join us for a conversation on civil rights and civil liberties in a time of political crisis. And I want to put to them the question, are we at a time of political crisis? I'd like to welcome Liz Weinstead to the stage. She is the co-founder and creator of the Abortion Access Front, as well as The Daily Show. Uh, which is interesting because it also emphasizes the importance of bringing humor. To all. I'm going to sit right there, but you can sit wherever you want to sit. Okay. I'll as long as I get to sit right there. Okay. All right. Uh, Anthony Romero, who's the executive director of the National ACLU. <laughs> Kathy Speller, who's the co-founder of Ms. Magazine and is the executive director of the Feminist Majority Foundation who's been fighting for women's equality uh, for a very long time. And then, uh, last but not least, Dahlia Lithwick, hey. senior editor at Slate, <laughs> who's been uh, keeping us informed about what's been happening in the political atmosphere and also at the Supreme Court. And then I'm going to sit down. I'm, I'm mic'd, and I'm going to pretend to be Oprah tonight. So. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and we'll conclude the show with a little bit of a reading from uh, my book, yeah. Policing the Womb. Yeah. All right. yeah. And the criminalization of motherhood. And I am so deeply grateful for each of you being here. 
Uh, if you see the book and read the book, you'll see that they each did blurbs for this book. As Dahlia was telling me on her way here, she was crying, rereading the book. Uh, I wanted happy things to be able to say, but ah, you know, it, this was a book that took a long time because, uh, you know, every time I wanted to finish it, there was something more to talk about, something awful, more awful along the way. And part of that time, Anthony and I were on the phone. We worked together with the ACLU, but we were on the phone a couple years ago about it, and still it wasn't ready to come out because, yep. of course, there was Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and all the terrible things that have just continued to happen with regard to women and reproductive health and rights. But before we get to that, now in my Oprah-ness, my Michelle-ness, <laughs> I want to ask you what keeps you up at night in these times. Yo, <laughs> let's go there, right? This is, this is like, let's go like we're in a salon in Paris, right? As if we're in a room that only fits 20, uh, even though we're about 250. So what is it these days, because each of you have weighty positions, each of you have responsibilities towards a large public that you're communicating with, yeah. each of you. There must be struggles behind the scenes. And if you don't mind being a little bit intimate, what are the things that are concerning you right now? Do you want to start, Anthony? Sure. Um, <laughs> that, what's keeping me up these times are these times. Um, it's, uh, look, it's, it's, it's one of these moments when everything that we've kind of thought through about the, the strategies and the norms and the, the compass is just, the, the dial is just spinning. And I, I want to also say that I thought the book was brilliant. Uh, you must read it. If you haven't read it, you must read it. You must buy it. It's, it's a book of narrative. It's a book of stories. There are not a lot of my board members who say, will you blurb a book? And then I say, sure. Uh, but then I read it, and then I'm like, wow, this is a book I really want to read and read again and push out. Thank because you. it's a book of stories. I mean, the stories you tell of Ms. Munoz early on in the piece is just, it, it will pull your heartstrings. It will make your mind uh, work. I, I guess what's keeping me up at night is just, I find it, I find it, especially given the subject the matter of the book, I just have to name the author in the room. I'm just incredibly depressed, chagrined that here we are talking about this enormous inflection point around women and women's rights. And we have two old white guys running for president. And it just, it, does, it doesn't seem to me that we are making the progress we want to make. I was on the phone with two of the former women presidential candidates over the last couple of days. And I just, it just it's, it's, it's a heartbreaking moment that you come to this, here is where we are. Now, I'm not disparaging necessarily Mr. Sanders or Mr. Biden, but I just think there's something left that we have to really probe and be willing to unpack about the, the misogyny, which is really uh, still rampant in, in systems and norms and structures of our political system. And that is exactly why they're passing these restrictionist laws, because our political uh, system and, and the elected government that we, that we want is not reflecting communities that are there to serve, whether it's immigrants or whether it's African Americans or whether it's women. And, I just think that's one of the things that keep me, how do we get from where we are to where we need to go? And I had been more hopeful that perhaps the process after the election of Barack Obama, and to be clear, I, I, I had my clashes with President Obama. There were the one or two times I've met with him in the, in the West Wing. They were not pleasant conversations. They were moments of clashing and disagreement. But I thought that that would be an, a, a turning point. And it just doesn't feel like it's been quite the turning point we I promise to close in a more upbeat way. I always start down <laughs> and end up more positively. But I think. But we promise to depress you along the way. <laughs> We're going to bring you back. Yes. Oh, there's Liz. All right. Everybody uh, jump in. What, what keeps, you keeps up? me up at night? I think a couple things keep me up at night. Um, the baseline that keeps me up at night is I feel like that there is no longer a terra firma that we stand on of shared values. And that, that, to me, in trying to communicate change, to communicate why things are happening, if we all can't agree on simple, simple sets of human decency, right. how do we do that? So that's like the overarching thing that really keeps me up at night. And the second thing is being somebody who is working 24-7, I'm on the ground 
four months out of the year in every single state that you've heard of, um, working directly with the clinics, um, because a lot of folks don't realize that um, in this landscape of activism that is reproductive rights, health, and justice, um, there wasn't an organization until I started one that was solely focused on the well-being of the clinics. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we travel around constantly. And, and when you provide abortion in a state like Georgia or Alabama or Mississippi or anywhere but Oregon, let's be real, um, <laughs> Oregon's great. Everywhere else is kind yeah. of a shit show. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Oregon is yeah. it. Um, they can't get someone to mow their lawn. Yep. They can't get someone to fix their fence. They can't get someone to fix their roof. So we go in and actually do that work for them. And then we do shows like this with comedy and music and then have a conversation with those activists and with the providers, with their own community, so that people can learn what needs to be done. And the community can hear from those people themselves and actually learn how to help support them. And so for me, um, watching how much legislation happens on a daily basis, yeah. literally a daily basis, versus how much... Isn't it exhausting? It's exhausting, yeah. <laughs> and how much it's reported on, yeah. how much we actually know. The fact that yesterday I was standing on the steps of the Supreme Court uh, with activists from around the country, and the case that could overturn Roe v. Wade was happening, and there was the only news coverage about it was that Chuck Schumer stepped in it, which isn't even news, shocker. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> And that's what dominated the narrative. Yeah. So for me, it is being asked time and time again as a woman and a person with a uterus that um, the actual fundamental decisions, which is when and if you want to have a child, are being decided by our government. And to be told that that is a wedge issue and to be told that self-determination of people with uteruses is somehow getting in the way yeah. of other people's political agendas yeah. by our allies, by our people who are on our side. I'm not even talking about the extremists. I'm talking about literally the silence of the good people. So, so here's a moment that's, that's worthy of a pause, particularly given that Jonathan Jackson is here and is Reverend Jackson's involvement and, and deep work and commitment with uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's worth noting that in 1966, he received Planned, Part Planned Parenthood's inaugural Margaret Sanger Award and wrote a brilliant speech yeah. um, accepting it, saying that it was absolutely cruel for a woman not to be able to make these decisions for herself, that there was a direct alignment between the civil rights movement and a women's rights movement. He said that it was unjust that in a, a country in a history where it was normal in an agrarian economy to have 10 kids than to be forced into a one or two bedroom tenement with, two, with 10 kids. Mm -hmm. He said it was cruel to bring a child yeah. into that world. And when challenged about this later in 1966 by a reporter in Wisconsin who said, why are you talking about these issues? Why do you care about these issues? And he said, because I refuse to segregate my moral concerns. That was 1966. Mm -hmm. Justice Blackman, the author who penned Roe v. Wade, was a Nixon appointee. Mm -hmm. right. And right. it was George H.W. Bush who shepherded Title X through Congress, signed by Richard Nixon. We've come a long way yep. mm -hmm. since that time. And when Richard Nixon signed Title X, which provides reproductive health care for poor people, in the New York Times he said, well, this is just basic common sense and yeah. public health. Yeah. We've come a long way. Well, and I think, and just to button that, and then I will be done, um, just that you bring up Title X, because um, just this year, the Trump administration has decided that the Title X funding um, can no longer go to clinics that provide abortion, refer abortion, or advise on abortion if someone asks. It's never gone for abortion, but most of the places that receive Title X funding are Planned Parenthood clinics and community clinics that do provide abortion, and instead they're diverting that money to fake abortion centers that purport to give health care, but they're run by religiously affiliated spaces. And so those are the only um, centers right now that are qualifying for Title X. So we've even taken Title X and decimated it. So, yeah, huh, happy. Yeah, right. Anyway. Something that Richard Nixon signed into law, yeah. now decimated in the oh. United States. And that's worth taking a pause on because when you think about Title X and you hear about breast cancer screenings, yeah. ovarian yeah. cancer screenings, all of that, that's Title X funding. Oh. What keeps you up at night? <laughs> <laughs> it's like all of this. Um, 
so many things. It's hard to, and you're right, it's exhausting because it seems like every day we, a, a new front in this war on our democracy opens up. And uh, women certainly have been a focal point of so much of what we have seen transpire in the Trump administration uh, and in these state legislatures where women have virtually no representation. I mean, if you look at the states that are passing the abortion bans, women are generally less than 12 or 13% of the people in the room getting to vote on those laws. And I, you give me credit for helping start Ms. I did not, uh, that was Gloria Steinem. Uh, but we took up the mantle of Ms. Magazine in, in 2001. I, I helped start the feminist majority and I had hoped that by now uh, we would be so much further along um, towards uh, realizing real full equality for women and girls, not only here in the US, uh, but worldwide. Because what happens in the US uh, reverberates around the world. Uh, and, and women's rights leaders everywhere will say that, you know, if, if you stumble, uh, we're crushed yes. uh, because of the US footprint in the world to this day. But I also have to say, even in, this, in these moments of sheer desperation for uh, when we understand the extent of the damage that is being done to our institutions that we have relied on to keep advancing civil rights and, and human rights, uh, the damage the U.S. is doing to the United Nations, uh, the damage that uh, we're doing to our, all of our systems of speech and uh, uh, our, our fundamental rights, I'm also extraordinarily encouraged the day, you know, the, the day of the inauguration, the day after, millions took to yeah. the streets uh, of not only this country, yeah. literally uh, in little yeah. towns, uh, in snow blizzards, in, in uh, Alaska, but yeah. on every continent, uh, including Antarctica. There was a demonstration <laughs> in Antarctica, a women's march. Uh, that shows us where people really are uh, as a whole, but it also, what keeps me up is can we, can we rise to the challenge of harnessing everybody's passion and activism to get back on track to making real change? And we have an opportunity in this election to do that. And nothing could be more important than taking back the power uh, of the Senate, uh, keeping it in the House, and taking back the power of the White House so that we can get back on track. So, um, you know, look, I'm a legal reporter, and so I, I panic. When I panic, it's about systems. Yeah. You know, it's about having, we have a minority-majority president, a minority-majority Senate, four minority-majority Senate-selected Supreme Court justices. We have gerrymandering. We have vote suppression. I mean, we have systems that are being ossified yeah. <laughs> that are making sure that this remains a country that is governed by people who look nothing like us. And, and that's trending wrong rather than yeah. trending right. And that, as just a legal matter, a formal legal matter, is really scary. Um, but I think the things that I worry about, and, and here I think I'm going to sound a little grouchier than Kathy, but I, I worry about these sort of two grinding sort of meta stories. And one is, I think, just the normalization of things that would have shocked us and yeah. gotten us onto the street. Absolutely. And so I, I keep saying to myself, every young lawyer I knew was out at an airport right. uh, the day the travel yeah. ban was signed. Right. And they didn't they were tax attorneys. They didn't do immigration law, but they sat there with their laptops and baggage claim <laughs> and taught themselves immigration law. We just extended the travel ban to a whole bunch of countries that have no bearing on what the in original intent was as blessed by the Supreme Court. Yes. Nobody was at an airport. Uh, I, I am with you on the women on the streets, and yet what I see, and this is the sort of counter imperative that scares me, is just exhaustion. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not an accident that every one of us has used the word exhaustion, right. because I think that normalization or the ability to just <laughs> be incapacitated to the point that nothing shocks you anymore is such an amazing bedfellow of exhaustion. So what do you all think, you know, what role does that then play 
in the minds of Americans, right? I mean, it, is, is it that the needle is, uh, is shifting and moving things that would not have been considered uh, even imaginable five years ago, 10 years ago, now within the spaces that you know, we're in? You know, in some ways, Anthony, you have a lot of behind the scenes baseball because you, you know, as you said, you know, look, you were in the White House with Obama saying that, look, here are some, some problems. But even so, do you think that, that, you know, we're confronting a time that's even more extreme than what you saw during the Obama administration on oh, some of these questions? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think part of what, I mean, certainly building up on the systems and norms, right? I mean, those are the, the, the things that really do keep you up at night. You can never get to sleep when you think mm -hmm. about how the systems and norms have been so altered in a way that, that it's hard then to, to push through the levers of change the way you want. I mean, we... We take as a fundamental premise that we will sue this government as often as we need to to hold their feet to the fire. We have filed the ACLU, just the Trump docket alone is 307 legal actions, wow. right? So we're not counting all the challenges to the abortion bans in different states. We're just anything that has a federal government or the president as a defendant, 307 lawsuits. Uh, about 118 of them only in the immigrants' rights context, mm -hmm. right? Those are really hard cases to win. Can you repeat that yeah. for the audience? So one-third of the Trump docket, the, the ACLU versus Trump docket, is in the immigrants' rights context. I was just at the court on Monday, so I, 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 I had to get back to California before I couldn't go for the Wednesday decision yesterday. But I was there for the, uh, the immigrants' rights case on Monday. And it's, these are tough cases. These are tough cases because the executive branch is, great, is given great deference mm -hmm. by the judicial branch. The, the Certainly Sotomayor just said last week. Mm -hmm. Took a lot of heat for that. You know, and we have to also underscore the point. Yes, this is a case that has enormous implications for the Trump moment or the Trump administration's agenda that's nativistic and xenophobic. Uh, where we're trying to argue that the, the courts have a role in reviewing removal proceedings around immigrants. Just a, a system of checks and balances, judicial review. We're not even arguing the merits. But we gotta remember that that law that we're fighting against was signed by Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. 1996, right? And so I can't help but sit in that court and say, yes, we, we have a system, the, 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 the laws and the norms have been so fully eroded, but the erosion happened much earlier than people were kind of paying attention to it. And so the question is, how do you come back from this? I, I, I tell my folks, we play for time. You know, so we bring smart lawsuits. We don't bring frivolous lawsuits. We bring aggressive lawsuits. If we only bring lawsuits, we win. We're not playing the game right. We have to be willing to kind of throw uh, long passes down the field. If you forgive the sports metaphor, I don't really play football. But <laughs> You know, I'm not even sure was right. I know. I just make it up as I go along. Um, and balls and strikes. And but, 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 balls look, and strikes. but look at look at the the dreamer issue, right? So the the Supreme Court will render a decision on on DACA on the dreamers. Hard case. Uh, Ted Olson argued it in the court. But we played for time, mm -hmm. for three years. These youngins, some of them in the room, have been able to keep the work authorizations have been able to fight and protest. And so we've got to look at the kind of, even if we lose that case, it's a hard case to win. I'm hoping, I'm hoping we win. But if we don't, we've got to also look at the fact that there's a, a, a glass more than half full, that we, we played for time. We, we are stopping that clock on the Trump administration as often and as, as aggressively as we can. And that's part of what we've got to talk ourselves into. I, I feel like I've been making the rounds. I've been talking to audiences like this. I talked to the Uber 1% trying to get pick their pockets and get them to write me checks. <laughs> I got a nice big check from two dear friends in the audience today. Thank you very much. Pat and Joe. Um, but I feel like I'm a dog whisperer for, of optimism. I gotta keep telling folks, like, you can't get depressed, you can't get cynical, you can't shut down, you can turn off the TV, but then you gotta re-engage the next day. Yeah. Because part of what we will really, what will get me really depressed is if folks of good mind and good conscience begin to withdraw entirely. That, that is not yeah. the option here.
But that's I, not happening. I, I, I also speak to a lot of audiences and uh, doing the same kind of thing that uh, Anthony is doing. And I can tell you, I have never seen such determination yep. by people to make a difference in this election uh, and to, to put their bodies out there as well as their money. Um, I think it's, ex it's an extraordinary time that what, I, what I keeps me up is can we help move it along? Can we help give it direction? Can we help give it clarity so that people People are not spinning their wheels and they know where to go. What are the states that we have to flip the U.S. Senate seats? Don't think it's, uh, you know, a, a, a state that, that isn't going to happen. Go to the states that it, it will happen. Go to Arizona. Go to Kansas. Go to Iowa. Go to Maine. I mean, we've got to take back the U.S. Senate to stop the stacking of the courts and to, and to begin to rebuild. But just to, uh, to come off of what you said, I mean, what, it is what we do in movements. We play for time. And then when we see an opening, we have to run through it. We see it. And that is our job as leaders, is exactly. to try and help figure out when to tell people to run and in what direction so that we can all go together so, over the So, good. Kathy, I'm looking at you, and then I'm looking at Dahlia, and I'm thinking, <laughs> you sound so hopeful. And then I'm thinking about Dahlia and what Dahlia said was just like, no, that feels like a whole lot of pain. And, and it actually makes me, you sort of think about Reverend Jackson being here right after Heather Hires death. Yep. Um, she, he came here and, and we had a convo about it. And it was interesting because I, I said to him, you know, are you hopeful? Right. Thinking that, you like, know, look, Heather Heyer just died. White supremacist ran her over. And he said, yes. He said, because you don't drown from the water, you drown when you stop kicking. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And, and I just want to add to what everybody said here. Um, part of the reason that I started abortion access front was because what happened after that election that was so powerful and people took to the streets, no one gave people guidance as to what to do next, right? Yeah. And so for me, what was crucial was the electoral politics is crucial, but we have to multitask. <clears throat> and the thing that I am incredibly hopeful for is being out on the road and creating these m groups of people who are working with the clinics. When you are on the ground and you every day are interacting with the people who are the victims of this supremacy, and you can say to them, I, I honor you in this community, I am here for you in this community, I am here to listen and in large and small ways participate. What we have done is give people and said to folks, if you have five minutes, if you have an hour, if you have a day a week, if you want to come out with us on the road and do this work, we're happy to have you. But I will give you something to do that I can tell you exactly. is meaningful. Exactly. Along with canvassing, yeah. along with making sure we take that, understanding and connecting with those we are fighting with and for is just crucial. That's what gives me hope can I, can every I just, day. Can I, go ahead. Can I yes, I, I love this. Interrupt. Yeah. Because then I, I want to come back to yeah. ask, why did you start this? Right. Okay. Right? Okay. Well, okay. Go, Dahlia. Yes. Put a pin in it. Yes. I'm going to, um, I think I, I actually can, can knit together three nice themes that I think are emerging just by saying, you know, we, we just did uh, my podcast. We just did a four part series on uh, voting. And it was called Election Meltdown. Including not my colleague, Rick Hassan. Rick Hassan, who yes. really was the spine of, uh, and you should read his book after Michelle's book. But um, <laughs> we really noticed that we were talking to all sorts of elections experts and state uh, you know, uh, elections officials and talking to people. And it was just unbelievably dispiriting. And then we talked to Carol Anderson uh, from Emory who basically reminded us that if you have black skin in this country or brown skin in this country, the things that are revelatory in 2020 are, are not just revelatory. Tuesday. Right. Right. Like yeah. Every single day of your life in the history of this country. And it's it was last a year. good bracing <laughs> reminder that, you know, part of what you're hearing when you see people freak out is a little bit of what Anthony said, which is this stuff has been baked in for centuries. Mm -hmm. This didn't just happen in 2016. Exactly. And one of the things, and that's why I love what Liz is saying, because I think one of the things that we need to do is take this sort of inchoate sense of panic from people who think this just began with Trump and will end with Trump and help them understand it doesn't matter who wins in 2020. 
these systems problems mm -hmm. are Various. endemic, right. yeah. problematic, and need to be fixed. And that's, I think, where you can say to people, and this is why I love uh -huh. Carol Anderson. She was like, you know what you do? You put on good shoes. Right. And you yeah. take your, your battery charger and your water. And you prepare to stand in line for six hours, which is what we saw people doing mm -hmm. in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. And I just think being super practical, super, super deliberative about yeah. this is life in America always. Yeah. And some of us were lucky enough to surf it. Yeah. And it's got to change from the ground up. And those are action steps that are not That's right. impossible. Yeah. That's right. You know, and, and in fact, on that note, <laughs> it deserves applause. Be because it is worth pausing to think about uh, what race means in this moment. Mm -hmm. Especially given Heather Heyer's death, uh, the march. I mean, in, in Washington D.C. In, in the last couple of weeks, you know, white supremacists with masks on and khaki pants uh, marching through the nation's capital. And it seems to me that for so long we've blown off uh, what Black and Brown people have said about um, our nation. You know, if it weren't for iPhones and Samsungs. Would we be a nation that would actually believe black people about uh, police misconduct right. yes. and the shooting of unarmed black citizens? Right. It has taken people with phones capturing this exactly. for there to be this sense of uh, credibility about what black people say uh, about those kinds of moments. You know, and it makes me think about Fannie Lou Hamer. Right, and a time through Jim Crow, where, where there it is, articulated exactly what voter suppression you know, looks like when black people are having to guess the amount of bubbles on a bar of soap, yeah. or the number of jelly beans in a jar, or recite the Mississippi State Constitution in order to be able to vote. You know, a nation with a very limited kind of, of memory. And in my mind, it is part of what then allows for the soil to be come fertile again, mm -hmm. such that we can see the cells spring up again as, as we have. You know, I'm not sure that we're a nation that has actually dealt with what it means for people to raise, you know, cards, billets, you know, and, and bid on people, yeah. mm -hmm. you know? And, and I've been saying recently because it, it, it came home to me in many ways after 2016, what is a kind of, What's the narrative that we need to tell, that we need to explore in order to understand our history that's been papered over? And, and I thought, you know, how long could someone stand in a movie to see people bid upon? You know, maybe after 20 minutes, we'd say it was gratuitous. Yeah. Right. And we'd run out and say, well, gee, we got the point after five minutes. They didn't have to let it go on for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. But then we're a nation that kept raising the card and kept passing laws, fugitive slave law and whatnot, raising the card over and over again and never dealing with that. And then never dealing with another horror. I keep this poster in my uh, office. And from time to time, I you know, ask a student or someone who's visiting what they see in the poster and they'll say, oh, it's really awful because it's about slavery. Yeah. You know, they're selling you know, oxen with slaves. Like, oh, yeah. And then I ask about the mulattas they're like, yeah, mulattas. Well, how do people get to be mulattas? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what does it say about these people who are being sold, the four mulattas who must be kept together? When people are willing to sell their own children and then a nation that never confronts dealing with any of that and what it means not just to the people who had been enslaved in those legacies, but what it means to the people whose families engaged in that. I think for us, I mean, I, you know, yeah. you know, I, I think there are a number of things. I mean, you're reminding me of the time, the weekend we spent together uh, with our national board at the Montgomery Brian Stevenson's memorial. If you haven't been, you must go, mm -hmm. right? Because it will help bring all this to light, and you see the archival work, and you see the newspaper clips, and then from there you think about the way forward. And so I'm just gonna. You know, what one issue, yeah, I mean, the ACLU is always challenged because we're a multi-issue organization with offices in every state. So it's very hard to, when you have that amalgam of issues and that amalgam of geographies, saying that you're going to pick one thing to do in a big way is fraught because there are always things that should be also number one. 
but I'm going to pick one. And I have picked one. And it's been voting and voting rights. <laughs> so we have, since the election of Donald Trump, our membership has quintupled. Uh, my, the C4, the political arm of the ACLU, has gone from, I don't know, about $21 million uh, when, when Obama was president to about $159 million this year, right? One of the, one of the largest C4s in the country. Uh, I have a very active, frothy base that is very involved in politics. Uh, we just did the analysis of all the contributions from our membership file to the presidential candidates. And for the first six months of the election, before Mayor Bloomberg started pumping in all this money, our list, which is two million people, so one half of 1% of the US population, comprised 18% wow. of all dollars to any presidential candidate, right? So I have a base that's engaged and involved. I even have 1.78% uh, of ACLU members gave gifts to Donald Trump. Those mm -hmm. folks I'm still looking to find, right? Great. <laughs> <laughs> but so with all the C4 and with all of this new membership, we have doubled down on voting rights. So our first big three bets was to expand the right to vote Florida with the ballot referenda to re-enfranchise individuals with former felony convictions. We spent close to $7 million to win that in Florida. Now we're fighting in the courts. We Get will win divorce, yeah. for sure. <laughs> Michigan, Nevada, we spent another uh, four million and a half between those two states to expand the right to vote. Those three ballot referenda, which we all we won them all, uh, about eleven million dollars will will re will enfranchise about two million voters in 2020, <coughs> right? And we're picking them strategically: Florida, Michigan, Nevada. Right? Those are smart choices on the political map. This year, we're going to Ohio, Arizona. Right? We'll spend another fifteen million dollars on two ballot referenda in those states to expand the right to vote. What we're thinking about beyond the census, right, because the census is going to be collected, we will double down and deal with the redistricting and reapportionment processes, not at the congressional level. I think Eric Holder and others will, man will manage that well. We're focusing on 10 to 12 southern <laughs> state legislatures to get in in a big way to draw these boundaries in a way that enfranchise black and brown and low-income people. And when we can't push through our, our redistricting maps, we will litigate the hell out of it because we're all one-stop shopping. We'll push it through the C4, we don't win, and they block us, we'll sue them. So these are the, these are the, these are the bets that we're making. In the elections in 2020 to try and change who's drawing those lines. And so for all of this work, and then obviously all of the kind of what you were saying before in terms of tracking what happens on election day, these shenanigans at the um, polls. I mean, it's, it's sinful. And these Democrats also need to be hauled across uh, the, the, the yes. I'm looking at Mark yeah. Rosenbaum and some of my colleagues here. It is disgraceful. Yeah. I was in Cal Northern California when I watched Super Tuesday. Mm -hmm. The idea that you had all these folks mm -hmm. lined up for six or seven hours mm -hmm. is just sinful and disgraceful. And in a democratic bastion like this state, it is just something that we need to haul them on their petards and say that is just completely unacceptable that the voting has become that difficult. So I, before we move to the courts, and I want us to talk about the yeah. courts, I, I, I want to ask you, Anthony, you know, given all that you say, there are some who could say, well, the ACLU is just a you know, Democrat organization. It really is partisan. What's your response to that? Look, we, we really do engage this with the core values. There was once a time when voting rights and reproductive rights and immigrants' rights was a bipartisan issue. Mm -hmm. There was once a bunch of Republicans we could point to and work with and who had the courage of our convictions, our collective convictions. That's not the parties that we're now confronting. So I'm not going to mumble my way and say, oh, I'm afraid of being partisan because I'm still fight fighting for voting rights or immigrants' rights or reproductive rights. We have not changed. A hundred-year-old organization, we've always been in these fights. What's changed is the political context around us. And we will need to find ways of ho holding both parties accountable. The Democrats, I'm looking at some of the data for the California state legislature and the lack of real diversity in some jurisdictions based on the geographies. I mean, some of this is new to me. I'm a New York boy. I went to school at Stanford for three years. But 
don't know your state politics the same way. Oh my God, this is really kind of unbelievable. It's the same set of issues we're confronting in New York. Mm -hmm. And so we need to really hold, I think, both the Democrats and the Republicans accountable. And there are different levels of, of the challenges we confront. But I, I think we can't run away from the challenges at, at, at hand and say, oh, I'm afraid of looking partisan. And we, we're fighting Trump not because he's a Republican. We're fighting Trump because of his policies. Uh, and we didn't have 300 lawsuits in the first three years of George Bush, right? <laughs> we had a couple dozen, right? That seemed like a lot. Uh, but I think we just have to continue to do what we have to do regardless of what, uh, what the criticism is, and we have to weather it. All right, I, I want to pivot um, before we begin our, our process of wrapping up because we've talked about legislatures, we've talked about Congress, we've talked about the state legislatures, and it's important to know to all of the points that you're making about these have been problems along the way. It was before Mr. Trump was in office, between 2010 and 2013, that we saw the inflection yeah. of voter suppression across states. Uh, the inflections of uh, the, the sort of striking down of rights that women had had in terms of reproductive rights, um, you know, anti-immigrant, you know, movements, though, you know, that was associated with the Tea Party. That was during Barack Obama's administration, right? Much of that. Um, Trump didn't, you know, get elected until 2016, which raises some real questions about, you know, who we are and the values in our country. But I, but I want to ask about, you know, what about the courts? You know, there are those that have said that, you know, what Republicans have done very well is to pay attention to the courts. And what Democrats have failed to do is to pay as close attention to the courts. What's your sense about that? And, and what does that mean with regard to the issues that you most care about? Um, I'll speak to the issues and, the, and, the, and then I'll let the court people speak to the court stuff because I think they're better <laughs> at it than me. We have Dahlia. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but for me, because it, 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 it goes kind yes. of back to what you said, why did you get started doing yes. this? Um, I was in 2010 writing my book back in Minnesota where I'm from, and it's when all those laws started closing down clinics, and it's when um, anti-abortion extremists crafted model legislation and dropped it into 27 states, the exact piece of legislation, and clinics were shuttering, and I literally drove in my car with my two dogs, like an insane person, doing benefits and visiting clinics because I didn't know what else to do, right? And that's when I really realized as I went from state to state and I learned that... Um, Folks in states don't understand what state um, legislation is really like. And so it's like, okay, if we can get folks engaged in their own state politics, you can win there. Yeah. You know, That's you can win there. Exactly and, right. and that felt really exciting for people to learn that all these issues they cared about were really coming out of um, their state legislatures. And for me, the real hope is if we can make state politics sexy, yo! Yeah. Um, <laughs> as we watch Trump pollute our court system, we need to get people elected in our state houses yeah. who are not going to pass these laws to begin with. Anthony needs a vacation. <laughs> um, right? And so, so <laughs> but, but I really do feel like that's where I, that's why I travel to these states yeah. because folks who love comedy and they'll come to my show and they care and they're pro-choice, but they're not engaged. Um, when they hear totally from this, they're like, oh my God, thank you. Oh my God, what can I do? And that becomes real. And then all of a sudden they're at those city council meetings saying we want a buffer zone, we're supporting. Yeah. You know, and so those kind of things are why. And then the courts. The I, I courts. mean, I would, just say, I would just say quickly, look, this is the thing that makes me most crazy because... We walked into the 2016 election with an 84-year-old, an 81-year-old, and a 79-year-old. Oh, and a vacancy on the U.S. Supreme Court. Yeah. And we didn't show up. Yeah. I mean, we didn't show up. And, and senators who had blocked Merrick Garland from a, even having a hearing, much less a vote, were out on the stump if you were a Republican. They were out in October saying, not only did I block him, but if Hillary wins, I'm going to hold that seat open for eight more years. Yep. And you know what we had from senators on, on the Dem side? Crickets. Nothing. Yep. Not a peep. So we didn't campaign on it. We didn't organize on it. And surprise, by a two-to-one margin, anybody who ranked the court as their priority, by a two-to-one margin, broke for Donald Trump. 
So that was a complete and utter failure of messaging and organizing and prioritizing and people who are just like, eh, you know, they're both the same. Was Merrick Garland a strategically poor choice? There is a very, very, very strong case to be made in the rear view mirror <laughs> that what Barack, Again, think about what, what black people at the time. Right. That it, it wasn't. Been, it it should have been shrewd. Yeah. That, that, that it should have been somebody you know young and uh, of color that would have exce- it would have been like a better vice president than the white guy that was the vice president to have somebody that that you know a seat was being stolen from that was not a seventy year old white guy. But I say that with the absolute certainty that I think Obama just thought we would get it. Yeah. That we would fight for the 70 year old white guy because the alternative was catastrophic and we just didn't. Yeah. And so now like a quarter of the federal judiciary are, are Trump appointees, some of whom will serve for 50 years, some of whom have never set foot in a courtroom, some of whom don't know what a motion in limine is. Yeah. And that's what we have. And so I think like my hope, Michelle, is that we learned our lesson. I am so disheartened by the fact that this issue has not come up in any debate. Mm-hmm. Not in the debate. The politicization of the Justice Department under Bill Barr. At least I raised right. it tonight. Right. <laughs> like, if you want Anthony to get a vacation, <laughs> Anthony needs judges I mean, who are not 32 and, like, you know, raring to go. And I just think we utterly failed in 2016 to say that if you care about workers' rights and women's rights and the environment and all of it, the only tunnel to that is the court. And we just didn't do it. And I don't know that we're doing it now. Yeah. Right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, and by the way, Michelle Goodwin has a great article, a feature article in this issue of Ms. about the stacking of the courts um, and how... And you uh, all got issues yes. of it. Thank you very much for that, Kathy. Yeah. And you all have issues. That can be very different I, with an inflection. I wish I could have... Uh, Michelle, I wish I... I wish I could believe that it would have made a difference depending on the nominee that was put forward. Mm. I, I don't think it would have. And I think it's, you know, the reality is we, we are here because of abortion rights and civil rights and immigration rights and, and you know, the, the issues we care most about. But that is not what the court's about. Uh, the court is about business interests. Um, and McConnell had made a decision, um, and, and business interests have backed the Republican Party now, that, that, that is their major backers, uh, that they were going to control the court because what it's really about is no, uh, no regulation, uh, no civil rights or women's rights, the ability to mm-hmm. sue for the pay gap and for uh, inhumane working conditions, uh, workers' rights. All of these are the issues, really. Um, I mean, this is uh, the the abortion issue is almost a sideshow. They want us to focus on that. Mm -hmm. It's a fundamental, fundamental issue. There's no question about it. But at the end of the day, what the court is really there to do is to serve the business interests, and that's what they got. And McConnell was willing to do whatever he had to to make that happen. Yes, I think if we have got to engage this issue in the elections, I think though where people are is they know that Trump is bad. They know that what we've got to be sure is they understand that all the Republicans that are up are bad. Um, <laughs> it has become, every one of these issues has become politicized by the Republicans and by Fox News and the business interests that want to see us uh, uh, going the direction that we are. So I, uh, I think that's the major challenge is that people can connect the dots, but I think they're willing to vote whether they can connect all the dots or not. I think our job is to get them to the ballot box and to overcome the suppression. Effort. And, and one tiny coda, I think in addition to just pushing for you know chambers of commerce and business interests, the other thing that we are now seeing is a wholesale capture of the courts by a religious agenda. Yes. Yes. And I think it's it's just you know a crime not a retooling, to retooling a weaponizing yeah. of the First Amendment. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and 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 the First Amendment, and also you know that religious dissenters' rights are now going to get us out of all you know civil rights protections hard fought for fifty years. And I just think the failure again to really engage with what it means to have courts that are captive to certain religious dogmas 
and the failure to have a really robust response and conversation. I mean, your book is really, in that sense, doing the lifting on some of this, but I just think we cannot pretend that moneyed interests and also like very, very fringe religious interests are not all out of proportion influencing the judiciary. And, and I would yeah. just like to just take that one step further and say that um, within the anti-abortion movement, what used to be considered fringe is now mainstream. And, and for us, like understanding that the people who are bombing clinics, leaders of Operation Rescue, are writing legislation in Mississippi, in Wisconsin. They're having audience with people. So it's no longer that, you know, when you hear about fringe, like I almost feel like saying fringe, they have now normalized fringe. And what we think is unheard of is now part of what's happening yeah. in people creating legislation and having access and people also getting elected. But there's Probably. always been um, uh, a violent wing mm -hmm of these movements. Um, and there is tremendous crossover between the anti-abortion extremists and the white nationalists. Uh, and in fact, I mean, they, they are now wearing uh, some of the white nationalist garb uh, outside of the clinics as they're demonstrating. Uh, there's always been this more violent wing that I agree with you, there used to be a little bit more distance between the so-called mainstream anti-abortion movement or the mainstream Republicans, um, and, and they have come closer together as they see the value of the use of violence. We're, we're now in a, in a time, and we have been since they started killing doctors and bombing clinics um, and uh, bombing churches, uh, and we, d we haven't come to grips with that in this country, that we have a violent uh, element uh, that is uh, uh, extremely dangerous at this point because they're converging. I, I want to wrap up before I go to the podium and do a, a little bit of a reading with um, having a, each of you be able to respond in, in uh, one or two minutes. Um, one of our questions from the audience, which is, uh, what can we as individuals do to best assist efforts to preserve and protect civil rights, and it seems to me many people want to know what they can do to be helpful, um, how they can contribute their time, and they see individuals such as yourself deep within the throes of doing the kind of work that's admirable, that's getting things done. What do you think that members of our audience and those who are streaming can do? Who wants to start? I'll, I'll start. Yeah. Um, I would say, um, work on voting initiatives. It's it's crucial as you're like that. Just should be something that you do all the time. How, how whatever that is in your community, f find that out, and then focus on an issue that is going to keep you going. Yeah. Don't feel like you have to be at everything, but really find an organization that a asks something of you not just up for your money, we all need your money, God bless you, please <laughs> give us money, but also fi find something for yourself that an organization that wants you to be part of it because that will keep you going. Become the expert in your friend circle, yep. talk about what that means because I'm, everybody in this room who is here tonight, I guarantee someone said to you, I'm too busy to watch the news, what did you see, right? You're all that person that someone turns to. So continue to be that person in large and small ways. And also, um, confront racism when you hear it. Yeah. You know, if you're a white person, I don't want to hear any more think pieces about, I'm hired to this to go home for Thanksgiving with my racist <laughs> uncle. You know what? Tell your racist uncle a little bit about himself. <laughs> you live in the world where you want to embrace people, you have to confront that shit. Otherwise, you don't come up with peace, they do. They're bullies. Don't let them be that. <laughs> So I want to I want to pick up where Liz uh, right before left off is the importance of the of the down ticket races because this is where the ACLU is really spending a lot of its energy as well is looking at all the kind of local offices attorney generals mm -hmm. some of the state supreme court mm -hmm. elections some of the states are uh, have picked their judges with elections the sheriff's races. Yes. With little amount of resources, we can really make a huge difference. And that's why, for me, the ACLU, in terms of the issue advocacy around candidate races, has been largely down-ticket races. 
And each of us lives in a community that can do better. Uh, and that can be uh, that can be more aspirational to the values that we have, and that's a place where we can very much direct you. There, we have a, a whole new citizen mobilization program called People Power at the ACLU. We've never we are 100 years old. It's the first time we've ever built a program like this to deploy people on local activism, local politics, local ballot referendum, city councils. The second thing is the 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 indignation and the outcry is necessary especially if you're going to reach folks who are not going to be reached otherwise. Family separation was our lawsuit, right? We brought that first lawsuit February of uh, 2017. No one paid any attention to it. Then we found a second client, a client after Ms. L, the woman from Con the Congo, we turned it into a class action suit. We filed the lawsuit in, here in Southern California. We drew a Republican judge. We are like, oh. You know, that's why we came to Southern California, to kind of find a more hospitable job. <laughs> so we do Judge Sabra from San Diego. Didn't certify the class, didn't move on the injunction, didn't do anything with family separation until the public outcry, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. until the, the, the energy that came behind it. And then we could throw more wood onto that fire. Judges live in communities. They have to go to a local store. Their kids go to your schools. Their kids walk down the street. Their wives and husbands and partners are all part of the community fabric. They care about how their neighbors see them. And so the public response and engagement on family separation was what finally got Judge Sabra to certify the class, to grant the injunction, to mandate the government, to reunite all the kids with their families. We reunited 2,800 families with their children. A Bush-appointed judge was the one who held their feet to the fire, and that's because of the power of the people to put the pressure on that issue. And it's, and it's, and it's not going to work if people are just not paying attention or not kicking up a dust storm. <coughs> so that's really the, the, the marching orders for all of us. All right. But the courts are not political. Courts? <laughs> And I, your point is well made. And that's why I think the demonstrations outside the Supreme Court are important. I think we have got to know the, the justices and, and at all lower court levels and, and in state Supreme Courts have got to know that people are paying attention um, and that we're um, advocating uh, for uh, our rights um, and that we're staying informed and plugged in. There are so many grassroots uh, organizations. They're not even organizations. They're grassroots groupings. Uh, there are so many in this country now, um, and they're trying to figure out what to do. And they're they're uh, and they're very involved and active. I think it's the only uh, silver lining that has come out of um, this Trump period is that I think people really woke up and understand that democracy is a participatory process and that we have to rise to the occasion and get to the barricades. Um, and I, I am hopeful that we're going to be able to get back to a place where we can start making progress again uh, and repairing a lot of the damage. And, um, and the work of all of the organizations is, uh, we're all pulling together in the same direction and many, on many different fronts, and that's what it takes um, to move forward. Uh, occasionally, we always say movement has to move. And, and, I, <laughs> and I think that's what's happening. I, I, I truly do across these many issues. Um, so I also have uh, teenage sons. Um, and when I get tired, my 16-year-old reminds me that there's this beautiful, um, from the, the um, Hebrew text of uh, the sayings of the, the fathers, there's this beautiful line that says, it is not incumbent upon you to finish the work, but you are not free to desist from it. And yes. it's the perfect, like that's the seam on which we all live, that we're tired and we think we have to do everything. And we think we all have to deal with all the stuff, the entire, you know, aperture, which is, it turns out really wide. And we think we have to do all of it. We cannot. And that's what makes us exhausted. But we're not free to check out. And so whether it's, you know, my husband was in Pennsylvania, in rural Pennsylvania last week, registered 40 voters in two days. He is the most introverted, awkward <laughs> introvert. He said to me, he literally, first of all, ditched me with the kids who are crazy. And he was like, he was like, here's the thing. The hardest thing for me is to look someone in the eye. 
particularly someone I don't know. And after two days of doing it, he was just like, this is what we need to do, is look people in the oh, eye completely. and have difficult conversations and persist through the ugly, messy work of being a democracy. Yes. And I think it's that. Find your lane, like Liz says. Anything that you do in a community is easier than something you do alone. Yeah. 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 And Absolutely. find a community that is doing a thing that makes sense to you, and then do it. You don't have to finish it, but you have to start it. And the only other thing I would say, and I say this as a journalist, pay for your news. Please don't. Yes. <laughs> It doesn't, it doesn't have to be any one thing, but it has to be something because journalism is exactly as bad as our unwillingness to pay for it. Yeah. A round of applause for these wonderful, incredible leaders who have joined us. Now, I'm going to close giving you just a, a brief taste uh, of the book from the introduction, uh, which Anthony... Uh, flagged and talked about. This is not a work of fiction, although I wish it were. Some of the cases described here could recall the imagery evoked by Mary Shelley, author of Frankenstein, who tells a horror story about a young rogue scientist who creates an unsightly monster through clandestine aberrant experimentation. Although Frankenstein is the name of the monster's creator, Dr. Victor Frankenstein, readers would be forgiven for debating who the real monster happens to be. In Policing the Womb, the story of Marlise Munoz comes to mind, brain dead, decomposing in a Texas hospital, forced by state legislation to gestate a barely developing fetus while her body decays, and the anomalies in the fetus mount. Eventually, it is reported that the fetus is hydrocephalic, which means severe brain damage, in this case, and water or fluid developing on its brain. Medical reports also show that the fetus is not developing its lower extremities. The state knows brain death is irreversible. The hospital forces Marlise's body to shake, placing it on a bed that constantly, violently moves, which makes the dead woman's eyes flap open and shut. Likely frightening to some hospital staff, they decide to tape Marlise's eyes shut. Even if Marlise could see anything, which is unlikely because she is dead, now no one needs to look into her eyes to search for any signs of life. If the state believes, despite well-accepted medical science, that she is alive, it has now taken away her sight and forced her into a state of blindness while her body is poked and prodded. Marlise's shaking corpse stays hydrated through tubes that bring fluids into the body. Somehow the hospital finds a way to pipe away the waste. Everyone, including even the state, agrees that really she is an incubator. This is why the Texas law exists. This is not the novel The Handmaid's Tale, a dystopian opus written by Margaret Atwood made exceedingly relevant today. The shaking bed is not in the totalitarian fictional state of Gilead. No, this is Texas. This is why the state forces machines to be attached to Marlise's body to keep her organs functioning until they give out. The machines are not keeping her alive. They are simply keeping her organs viable. This is why the hospital cleaves into her body with slicing, lacerating, and stitching tools, tapes her eyes shut, pumps her with fluids, and then drains other liquids from what remains of her. Her decaying has nothing to do with senescence or aging. Rather, it is the typical decomposition characteristic of brain death cases. I'm going to leave you with that. <sighs> Read the book and you'll read learn the book. more. Can I Thank just, you. Can yes. I add one thing? Yes. The, the state legislator who proposed that law named Matt Schaefer twice ran unopposed. That is why elections matter. Yes. <laughs> and thank you once again, Dahlia, Kathy, Anthony, and Liz. Thank you so much. Thank you.